Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah? Good. <laughs> so, hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth edition of Indicate Europe. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Uh, thanks for everyone who came back every year. It's uh, really important for us, and uh, we appreciate your presence. So, thank you. Um, a lot of you have been a, an inspiration uh, for one of uh, the most important themes of this year, which is communities. And uh, for us, like Indicate Europe is about creating a space to exchange on ideas, experiences, on techniques, and thought. It's about gathering, nurturing, and supporting. This year edition novelties include this new venue. If some of you have been to the previous edition, you have like see that it's a very new uh, spaces. And uh, thanks to Capital Game and uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, the new partnership, uh, we, we have this. So uh, we are really grateful. So may this be the beginning of a sustainable collaboration for the future editions. Uh, we also have workshops this year in the other part of the building. Uh, be sure to, to have a look at the program if you want to attend it. Um, we also have individual legal counsel and advice for the protection of your right as a worker in our industry, and also session about uh, anti uh, IP and copyright. Uh, these things is making possible things to the valuable help of the STGV. So STGV, thank you very much for, for that. And uh, everything is in the leaf left. If you have any like, question, you can also grab a volunteer. They have a dark T-shirt and they are all around. And um, one last thing before we start. Uh, if someone or something makes you or anyone feel unsafe or unwelcome, uh, please do not hesitate to find us and report it. It's very important for us that you feel at home here and that's a, a welcoming space. So that said, uh, I wish you to enjoy the full program. And uh, I will leave the space because there's more important people to come now. So welcome, uh, Laura Dilloway, for her talk. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here today. Thank you all so much for coming and sitting in the auditorium with me. Uh, this is me. I'm Laura Dilloway, and I'm here today to talk a bit about my experience coming from a mid-sized AAA studio to a tiny indie studio and the changes that I implemented on our latest project, Heaven's Vault, in order to get it out to the door. So for the last couple of years, I've been the lead environment artist at Inkle in the UK. And for those of you who don't know us, Inkle is best known for its work on Steve Jackson's sorcery series and the steampunk take on a classic 80 days. This year has been a really busy one for us. First of all, finishing off the huge endeavor that has been Heaven's Vault, which is an archeological narrative adventure which we released on PC and PS4 in April. At the beginning of October, we also released the Switch port of 80 Days, and we're currently working on a range of bits and pieces, including concepts for new things and wrangling Heaven's Vault onto a Switch ready for release early next year. And if you'd like to see how that's shaping up, I'll hopefully have the premiere of the Switch build in the share and tell area at 3 p.m. today. It's still very much a slightly buggy work in progress, but generally speaking, we're really excited at how it looks and feels on a handheld device. Although I've worked in games for over 13 years now, I've actually only worked at one other place besides Inkle. I started out at Sony's studio in Cambridge, and I stayed there throughout the transition to Guerrilla Cambridge until the studio was closed in January 2017. I knew Joe and John, the founders of Inkle, from working with them at Sony, and messaging them to see if they had any jobs going was an easy decision for me. For years, they'd been making interesting and really culturally responsible games, and I wanted to be part of that, and luckily they agreed. A very nice chat and a coffee later, and suddenly I had taken the deep, dark dive into indie development. Now, I love the Inkle team very dearly, but they'd recently gone from being a tiny company making 2D mobile games to being a very slightly less tiny company trying to make a huge 3D PS PC PS4 game without knowing anything about 3D. And I arrived and started trying to pick, unpick what was going on with the art that had already been put into the game, and I mostly couldn't find any of it. 
There was some kind of file structure and there were some assets, but there were different structures going on in different folders, different assets being prepared in different ways, files being added to the project that weren't even being used, and any kind of cohesive scale across the environment had mostly just gone out the window. So Houston, we had a problem. In this talk, I'm going to try and run through some of the processes and conventions that I implemented for the art team on Heaven's Vault, which had become second nature to me during my time at Sony and Gorilla. I came from somewhere that had had years to build up libraries of assets and refined pipelines, to somewhere starting every single piece of art brand new from scratch. The changes that I made felt like obvious things to do to me because I've never done anything different. My fellow Inkles encouraged me to speak about this topic today because they'd never seen anything like it. AAA does organization because it has to. The indie scene is growing so fast that I don't think it can avoid it for much longer. It's not fun, unless you're a bit weird like me, but it will make your life easier. The way we did things is by all means not the only way, but I hope that if you're just starting out or if you're looking for ways to make your processes more efficient, that there might be something here that is useful in helping you develop a system that works well for you. So before we start, I'd just like to show you our trailer so that you can see where all this work ended up. I'm an archaeologist. I dig stuff up. Every ancient inscription I decipher is a piece of the puzzle. Every moon I sail to reveals a new path to explore. And every new discovery can change the story entirely. History belongs to everyone. It's how we know who we are. But will the story I put together be the truth? Okay, so step one. On arrival at Inkle, my first job was to figure out exactly what it was that we were making. Not in terms of what is Heaven's Vault as a game, but what on earth does this look like? Inkle had some internal documentation, but it was very high level, and the story necessitated an entire range of unique and varied locations that you could visit and explore. And this being an archaeology game, the way that those locations related to each other also had to absolutely make sense, so that the buildings created in similar eras were of the same architectural style, and there was a visual progression in terms of styles and shapes evolving throughout the ages. Thus was born the Heaven's Vault Style Bible. I took Joe's starter images, and by cross-referencing them with Joe's synopses of the various levels, and expanding them with more specific reference, I wove together a definitive guide on to how everything looked and why so that when we were building levels, any of the artists on the team had something that they could check up on and know what materials, shapes, and colors they needed to use. The archways and how their shapes changed were one of the key ways that I chose to show which buildings belong to which era, and so their evolution is continually documented. These are some of the material swatches, for example, and so on. You might be wondering, why all of this effort when you know nobody will ever see it, but you'd definitely have noticed if we hadn't bothered. The Style Bible not only grounds you and focuses your direction, but if it is something that works just as well for 30 artists as it does for three. It's like a visual dictionary. It allows artists to be on the same page, but with giving them the freedom and the autonomy to create visually consistent things without needing to be micromanaged, which in a small team is really important. Any time we made anything from a new era or started work on a new location, we knew exactly where to start because of the Style Bible document. Inkle had shown a demo at GDC shortly before I started the company, and so there was already a substantial amount of work in the repository, but finding it was another matter, as I mentioned. The second thing I did when I arrived was to completely overhaul the entire structure of how the environment art files were created, where they were, and how assets were set up for the game. One of the things that I've loved about moving to indie development is that we're so often the person wearing a particular hat for an area of the game. Can you imagine, however, how it would work if you needed to add a brand new person to help you out, or if you needed to, to take over someone else's hat? 
if everyone is merrily doing their own thing, the effort spent trying to pick through someone else's files can soon become a huge source of wasted time. I hereby beseech you, go forth and organize. Let's start with the basics. Version control and autosave are your friends. If you're not backing things up as you go, please consider doing so, especially considering Maya's tendency to crash if you kind of look at it a bit funny. Once you've got your backup system ready to go, get organized. Make your work file structure as similar as possible to your runtime file structure and keep the two separate. Work files are your PSDs, your Maya files, your substance files, and so on. Runtime or game files are just the files that the game needs to load when you hit play, and we want to keep these as streamlined as possible. There was already a scenes game folder when I arrived, so I created a separate scenes work folder for all our Maya files. Similarly, there was a pre-existing common game folder, so I added subfolders for models ready to put the environment assets in and copied this folder over to a new matching work file directory too. The result is this. You can see I've marked the matching folders with arrows. On the left is the work file directory, and on the right is the game file directory that gets loaded into the Unity project. These are completely separate directories. They're stored in different areas on our machines and backed up completely separately so that the game files stay as clean as possible. The matching directories, that mean that we can locate an unfamiliar work file by checking where the game file is, and you know where to export a game file to based on where the work file is, which is really handy when you're looking at someone's work that you didn't start. If you're going to be dealing with a lot of small objects, I also recommend classifying and dividing up your assets based on type. I used a modified version of a structure that I'd become very familiar with working on Killzone for Gorilla, but I updated it to match our project engine and workflow. Any assets that were going to be used across the large majority of levels were put in the new common slash models folder. We divided them into building blocks, which are your generic construction pieces like doors, beams, windows, and so on. Then props, which is your more specific stuff like tables, chairs, and furnishings. Differently, we separated out all the plants into a foliage folder. And this was so that our tech artists could easily find all the plants in case they needed any special setup to work with custom shaders. In turn, all these objects are divided into smaller categories so that all the framework structures are grouped together, for example, or all the mining-related props. This makes everything really easy to find, even if I don't know exactly what I'm looking for. I can, for example, be like, I need a plant to go here and go to the plants folder under foliage and just have a rummage around to see what I can find that works best. The other side to this is the level-specific jump tree, and this falls into two parts. Firstly, there were the level-specific props, which were stored in the scenes folder instead of with the generic ones in common. This was largely to prevent props with a specific story purpose being wrongly used elsewhere in the game, but it also works both ways, because you could also go, ah, oh, I need that clay statue from the Emperor's Garden, and hey, you know where it is. In the Unity browser here, you can see how we further organize the game asset folders into materials, prefabs, and textures, and this was done throughout all the geometry folders, so the structure was kept matching throughout the whole game. The second part is slightly more nebulous and involves the custom geometry that was built for each level, the rocks, landscapes, buildings, and anything else that had to be built in world space. From Sony, I was more used to engines where you divided a level into sections, then built each section in a separate Maya file that then got exported and to compress game data with the same name as the file that you'd made. You always knew where a bit of geometry had come from because it was literally just the file name. With engines like Unity, however, obviously it's different. You export your geometry from your modeling program as an FVX or whatever, and then assemble, apply shaders, and do everything inside the editor itself. I therefore devised a system that made the best of both these methods. We still divided the level up for ease of working, but then we'd divide those sections into smaller chunks and export those individually so that we didn't have to re-export the whole file every time we made a change. This really adds up if you're making a lot of small tweaks, both in times of file, in file sizes that you need to submit to your repository and time spent double-checking that ran, Unity hasn't randomly reassigned all your materials. And it also helps demarcate areas that are needed for things like nav mixture generation, hence the ignorable group you can see in this picture here. Crucially, the main difference was that we prefixed the name of each of these small chunks with a shortened version of the file name, so anybody who needed to go work on a piece of geometry could instantly deduce which Maya file they needed to open. This example is quite simple because there's only one file, so obviously MB is the shorthand for mine buildings. Other levels, such as the Emperor's Garden, had a number of different sections, however. So here, 
if the geometry had the prefix GLC, I could tell that the work file it had come from was the glass house courtyard. As part of the file structure overhaul, I also standardized the way that the assets are made and added to game. And this is something that I really recommend you do, even if you do nothing else covered in this talk. If you're working in 3D, define a texture rate for your textures before you start. If you're working with 2D, sort out your PPU or pixels per unit. In our case, this was done by our tech artist based on their assessments of the project's budgets. This means you don't waste time and memory creating either huge textures or textures that turn out blurry, and all of your visuals will be a consistent resolution across the whole game. Deciding on these numbers will be based on a range of factors. For example, how large your screen is, how complex your textures need to be, and how close up you'll be able to see things. You honestly don't need to make anything a 24 or T8 unless the number you have calculated calls for it. My junior was actually really incredulous the first time I told them something only needed to be like a 128 by 64. But it was for a set of really small tools, and the math doesn't lie. Once you have figured out how big your texture should be, also your PSD at the twice the, sorry, once you have figured out, figured out how big your texture should be, also your PSD at twice the size that you need, and then save it out at the calculated resolution. This way, if you find that an asset looks not quite how you wanted it to in-game, and it needs a bit of a boost for whatever reason. You can just save the texture out at the bigger size, rather than having to make it again from scratch or run through some hacky textures to get the texture filters to get the effect that you want. There are plenty of scripts that are readily and freely available to help you lay out your 3D model UVs to the right resolution now. And I think it's actually built into the latest version of Maya. So the tools that you need for this are growing more and more commonplace all the time. Text or density also applies to materials. Importantly, 3D geometry that uses tiling textures needs to be UV'd at the resolution that the textures were authored at. The bricks here are created at a 512, and so the UVs must be projected as such, or the texture looks wrong. Similarly, the stone slabs are a 1024. Look what happens when we project the same texture rate, but with the bricks based on the texture being a 1024, and the stone slabs being a 512. You'll get the same effect if you mess with the scales of your assets and make them much bigger or smaller than they create, were created to be. So this is why we want to work out what our target density is before we start, so that we can keep everything consistent. On a related note, work out what kinds of texture maps you need in advance, based on your technical and aesthetic requirements. Most of our final game objects actually only have a color map, and adding anything else would be just needlessly bloating the game files. Next, use metrics. One of the things I had my junior do when we first started all the prep was to work out the size of all the basic bits and pieces, in particular steps and doors. This was done on a combination of what looks best and what works nicely with the nav mesh parameters. It allows a smooth transition between building gray boxes and populating levels with assets from your library, and also allows you to easily switch between variants, for example, if you've got one kind of step and you decide you want to use the other. This is particularly relevant if you've got any kind of combat requiring cover objects in your game or movement, for, for example, such as jumping. Make sure you're all using the same scale, axis, and export options, and be aware that different packages handle different units, units properly, differently. Sorry. I, I've seen a few indie projects where like, everything was coming in sideways and upside down. Like, I don't care what's up, just decide. <laughs> If you've got a player character, use them as a size reference every single time that you build something. And ooh. also, it goes without saying most of the time, but try and build your assets with modular assets in mind. It's more efficient. It helps reduce the number of draw calls in your game. And that's definitely something that will come back and bite you if nobody is keeping an eye on it when it goes to a performance. Set the pivot on your assets somewhere useful based on how you're going to use objects. Use the object particularly if you're going to be using snapping a lot. And I would also recommend that you zero all the transformations in your base file so that everything is nice and zero when you bring it into the editor. It will make your life easier in so many ways. Just trust me on this one. If you're using collision meshes, keep them as tight as possible to the visual mesh unless you have a particular reason not to do so. I just recently discovered one of our tables has a slightly too generous collision mesh, which means that anything that's been snapped to its surface is in fact floating. Um, the collision meshes are especially important if you're doing anything with bullets or projectiles. 
On Killzone, to optimise physics performance, we actually would give objects a low detail mesh for regular player bumping into things collision and a second, more accurate mesh for bullet collision that took into account things like holes in the object. So that might be something to consider if it's relevant to your project. The switch port of Heaven's Vault that I'm working on now will hopefully be shifting without the levitating plates, but if you do find any more than I've missed, it's a feature. To continue, unify your asset setup. This is something that was really strongly drilled into me as a junior. Our asset work files have the same name as the asset, and then everything within that file shares the same material and textures. At Gorilla, we used to name the different components in a set like this using suffixes of C001, C002, and so on, but it was really hard to know which piece was which unless you'd spent quite a lot of time working in the asset database. So I updated our system to use a suffix that was a very brief description of the asset, like this, for example. So we have door wooden 01 left for a left hinging door and door wooden 01 for a right hinging door. It's instantly understandable and it's still pretty scalable. Our walkway set, for example, is probably the largest and it has 14 different pieces in it. Furthermore, name your textures and materials in a consistent way that relates to the asset. I spent a lot of time making assets for Killzone 2, and the export pipeline would fail if you didn't get the names of everything in a file 100% correct. For Heaven's Vault, we didn't have the fancy tools, but I did implement similar naming conventions. At the very least, if for some reason the textures or materials or an asset have accidentally got swapped around, you always know what to reapply because it will have the same name as that asset. Consistency allows you to keep a handle on things, whether your team and your project are big or small. And if you're lucky enough to have someone who can make automation tools, it's a win for everybody. Being rigorous about this kind of stuff may seem like a pain, but it's excellent housekeeping. It reduces the opportunity for weird bugs to creep in due to things like assets not being set up properly. It helps to minimize time and wasted time and memory bloat. And it makes it easy for artists joining your team to pick things up and for people already on the team to find and work with content they were not the original author of. It also makes assets easily transferable between projects because it provides a solid framework within which to add to your library of content. This leads us nicely onto the final part of this talk, production and scheduling. In a large studio, producers are everywhere with at least one per discipline. They're not always well liked, particularly if they're nagging you to update the tracking software, which is Handsoft, but they are necessary to keep all parts of the project flowing together. In very small teams, though, as we know, it's more likely that somebody will have to take on wearing the production hat alongside their regular duties, and I call that person with me. If I had ignored this vital job, though we would not have finished any of the artwork for this project on time. When I first rolled out my asset tracking spreadsheet, we didn't have any assets at all, so to the rest of the team, it seemed like I was being particularly keen. That same document now has over 800 assets in it, and nobody is complaining now. Track what you've made so that you can make the best of what you have. You'll instantly be able to see what assets you have available to you and what can be slightly modified to give you something new. Do you need a different plaster material? Colour shift the original white one and jiggle the dirt layer up a bit. Do you need a different uh, a heavy metal bound chest? No problem, we've already got a fancy wooden one. We can just retexture that one. Every time I added a new asset to the list of things to make, I was constantly assessing, do we really need this? Does it need making from scratch or can I modify something that already exists? How much reuse will I get out of it? Is the time needed to make it worth the value that it will add to the game? If there's more than one of you working on your, on your area of the project, you need a person to adopt this kind of oversight. Most of us don't have another 10 artists we can divide work between. Every minute we spend doing something that we didn't mean to do, the more likely it is that something else won't get done at all because we ran out of time or worse, money. In addition to tracking what we were making, I also tracked the progress of individual assets through the production pipeline. Very often I would find myself needing an object before it had been made. So we would make what we called speed models, which is something I first did on Killzone Mercenary, working for the outsourced team. You make a rough version of what you need, but to the right scale and proportion, complete with LODs and collision, even if it's just one mesh duplicated to make the others and the geometry isn't cleaned up properly. This allows you to get the prefab set up so that you can get straight on with using them in the level, and then the model can be tidied and UV'd at a later date. Or, if you decide that the piece isn't working as you expected it to, 
you can update it and make it work better. Or if you find that you're not needing it at all, you can remove it from the set before you waste texture space on it. Another advantage to working this way is you can easily adjust the textures after seeing them in situ. If you're building assets in isolation, it's so easy to take each one to the maximum, with the result that when you put everything back together, it looks too busy, or the colors don't match. We had a massive problem on the Killzone mercenary assets because they were all supposed to be quite rusty, and so you know, we sent each one off to outsource, with its, complete with its rusty edges and everything, and then we got them all back, put them in game, and they just looked terrible because it was so busy. So we had to pair everything back to much simpler textures. Speed models allow you to really easily just do this as a gradual process. They require little pre-planning, but then you can adjust the models on the fly based on how they look once they're assembled. And because you're tracking whether the assets are finished properly or not, there's no chance of speed models accidentally making it into the final game. For the first six months or so, I was actually largely doing this all in Google Sheets. Please don't judge me. It worked okay because the art team was just me and a junior, but as we progressed through the levels and gained an extra person, so there was three of us, I found myself missing the ability to assign tasks and see a burn down of how much left there was to do, something I was very used to doing using Handsoft, which is the aforementioned and widely hated professional planning tool. On our tiny team, we didn't actually need something so complicated, however, and our tech artist pointed me to this tracker called Pevitor, which is web-based. Of course, there are other solutions, but I really wanted that burn down. And Pivotal was one of the only ones that did this. The reason I like the burn down chart is it allows you to see how much work is left in terms of time needed, as opposed to number of tasks, because these are often very, very different things. I find that when you're faced with a seemingly never ending list of things to do, it's really important to still feel like you're making progress. So break down tasks so they're as small as possible, and it makes things much easier to tick off. The burn down not only allows you to see how far you've got left to go, it reminds you how far you've come. The definition of who or what an indie developer is is becoming more and more blurry. Many of us are still groups, small groups of creatives borrowing the Wi-Fi from a local cafe or working from home in our spare time. We may be the only people who ever see our working files and we may not have to work, schedule work for anyone other than ourselves. But what if we aren't? How do we explain to a collaborator how best to author assets and add them to game if we don't know ourselves? What if we need these files to go on and make another project or a bigger project with a whole team of people? Being indie doesn't mean that we can't hold ourselves to high standards of working practice. I would argue that we need them just as much as a large studio. The great thing is we can be so much more flexible. We can mold our processes to fit our needs and action them immediately where a large studio would take months, if at all, to even start making any changes. I'll always be immensely proud of what we achieved on Heaven's Fault, but I'm particularly proud of what my tiny little art team did in under two years, from nothing, with no crunch, and a couple of spreadsheets. Thank you. I'm not sure if there's time for questions. Is there time? There's no time, Laura says no. Um, but I'm wearing a very red dress. If you see me, come and say hi, and you can ask me questions on the floor. I'll be in the show and tell from three to five, so, and I'll be here tomorrow as well, so come say hi. Thanks very much. No, it's fine. Like, it's my fault for making it too long. <laughs>